seeing is that the way we use our upper body creates a lot of downward pressure on our pelvic floor. So that could be dietary, that could be constipation. So that's huge for pelvic floor issues. Apparently, so Daniel Lieberman says that you start building up inflammation in your muscles after about 15 minutes of stationary positioning. Uh -huh. This addresses some of the hip flexion ankle stuff. So I am a big advocate of uh, what's called minimal shoes. Well, welcome on in everyone to today's podcast. I have the pleasure of speaking with Petra Fisher and Petra is a natural movement teacher. So think hanging, squatting, walking, barefoot, where we will be talking about that. And Petra loves talking about and teaching all about our feet and how this is the foundation for our overall health in our other major joints as well. Petra has also supported thousands and thousands of her students in their own journeys of body awareness as well as resilience and physical self-empowerment through her free and also paid programs. So she does a lot of online teaching and classes. I will be asking her about that as well. Petra, welcome on into the podcast today. I'm so happy to be able to finally speak with you. Thank you. I'm super thrilled to meet with you today as well. Yeah, we're going to have a fun conversation. Okay, so let's get right into it. Please tell me, how did you get into this whole world of natural movement techniques? Tell us a bit of your, your history and your backstory. Yeah, for sure. It was definitely not by choice. I am... Um, I totally wasn't ever going towards movement. I was um, actually a lawyer for a while, but while I was a lawyer, I also wanted to be, yeah, in Toronto actually. So right oh, close to In you. Toronto? No way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to U of T and I, I worked on Bay Street and oh it killed God. me. It ruined my health and I hated it. So like I was not a good fit in law at all. Um, but meanwhile, I was trying to be super fit. So I was like running and going to the gym and I had a personal trainer and all that kept happening was chronic injuries. So I knew that I was doing something wrong and I just didn't know what. So I spent about five years transitioning out of law. I had an interim job with the Ontario government, which was wonderful, but it gave me some time to explore. And I was like, oh my goodness, you know what? Bodies are what I'm actually interested in. But I was thinking about being like a massage therapist or a physiotherapist. And then I got my first movement teacher who was actually a Pilates teacher. And I was like, oh my gosh, movement is what's missing from my life. This is the actual way to fix my body stuff. It was just a total light bulb moment. So as soon as I started learning that movement therapy was a thing, that was what I wanted to do. And I really never looked back from there. So that was about 10 or 11 years ago now. Really? So fascinating. I mean, I can totally relate to the fat, you know, fast paced life and doing exercise because I believe, and this is why I've also had Erwin LaCour, you know, um, from MoveNet and interviewed him as well about the fact that a lot of people are thinking that they're doing exercise and it's great for their health and they're doing it in the right way, but they're actually aging themselves and their joints more quickly um, because they're not doing the right type of movement and the right type of exercise, if we want to call it exercise. Um, and really at the end of the day, it is about movement and keeping, you know, lubrication in our joints and our fascia and all of those um, very important tissues in the body. Uh, can you tell us, let's dive right in, um, when we're talking about women's health, and because I have a lot of female followers and having had four babies myself self pelvic floor issues and thankfully I'm okay knock on wood um, but in terms of prevention and keeping things strong and uplifted can you delve into this area for us a little bit why this is so important especially for women yeah for sure so I do want to say men get pelvic floor issues also okay, um, yeah. and often it's not recognized so uh, let's not forget them but okay, it is that's certainly good, yeah. a very big problem for women uh, the same so, you know, I think of myself as a movement coach and someone who thinks about movement the same way you might think about diet. So you're a naturopath, you probably think a fair bit about, you know, your nutritional profile. It's the same with movement. So I believe that humans evolved to get certain types of movement and we're really adaptable so we can do weird stuff too. But, you know, that walking, that squatting, the stuff Erwan does, um, he's fabulous. Those are the things we evolved with and our bodies seem to thrive the most with when we get a kind of a movement diet that's similar to that. So when it comes to our pelvic floor, I love teaching about pelvic floor health because your, your pelvic floor is, you know, it's at the center of your body. So everything that happens from your feet up to your hips affects your pelvic floor because force gets transferred up from there as you walk or run or jump. And everything from your top down also affects your pelvic floor. So the way you breathe, the way you use your core, even how you move your shoulders can affect your pelvic floor health. So it's grand 
ground zero for movement. So as a movement coach, it's impossible not to think about pelvic floor stuff. And a lot of the ways that we as modern humans move, not through your fault, just because it's what we do, are really not helpful for pelvic health. So I think that's one of the reasons it's such a huge issue for women. So it's something I really like teaching about. And you can make huge, huge changes with how you move in terms of how your pelvic floor will function. And, and what would be some of the major causes of, you know, dysfunction in the pelvic floor for both men and women? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, it's, it's a big topic, but frequently what we're seeing is that the way we use our upper body creates a lot of downward pressure on our pelvic floor. So that could be dietary, that could be constipation. So that's huge for pelvic floor issues. It could be babies, super natural, but especially if you have a tight pelvic floor, then having to get a baby out, that's a lot of pressure. But it's also what you do every day. So for example, if you don't have good core strength patterning, what you might do to stabilize your core is hold your breath, which tends to be downward pressure on your pelvic floor. And every time you reach for your cast iron frying pan holding your breath pressuring your pelvic floor not ah. super helpful it ah. could even be your breathing technique so if you tend to be a belly breather which i guess taught in yoga all the time on yeah. a long-term basis that could be not so great for your pelvic floor really? so there's a ton of pressure stuff yeah, yeah. it's crazy right you don't think yeah. about it no, but no. you know you, you breathe twenty thousand times a day every time you take a breath if that's a downward push on your pelvic floor that's not so great for your pelvic floor so oh, wow. those tissues fail because all tissues will fail if they get too too much load the same thing happens bottom up. So your pelvic floor is a set of muscles. You can think of it like any other muscles and they need to shorten and they need to lengthen and they need to hold force. And so if we don't do a lot of stuff with our pelvic floor and don't move our pelvic floor very much, mm. it gets weaker because it's a muscle. So wearing high heeled shoes tends to kind of push our bodies forward, tends to compress the back of our pelvic floor, flat butt syndrome, where people are really just standing forward. It's, and that's maybe a bad term for it, but people with flatter butts tend to have a lot of back posterior pelvic floor tension. And it's uh -huh. usually just how they're standing and from wearing heeled shoes and from sitting in chairs a lot. And it right. kind of creates this movement habit that then translates to pelvic floor health. Mm. So chairs, chairs are big for that. How you sit yeah. in chairs is big for that. The shoes you wear is big for that. Hip mobility is huge for it. So most of us don't move our hips in a lot of ranges of motion. That also has a big pelvic floor impact. So you're getting it from the bottom and from the top, if that makes sense. I see. So for someone like myself and a lot of my, you know, viewers as well, we sit and work at our desks, at our computers for multiple hours in the day. What is the optimal way to be sitting to take or to help our pelvic floor? Is there, do you have a technique for this? I actually do. Absolutely. Yay. So, I mean, I will say first, if you have a chance, I highly recommend a standing desk and I highly recommend a floor sitting station. And I know we're going to chat about sitting on the floor because that gives you variety and what your body is craving is variety more than almost anything else. So, yeah. you know, sitting in a single position just isn't the fix, but it can make a difference. So I actually don't have a chair with me, but I can show you on the ground as well because the same thing, um, the same thing applies. So what you don't really want to be doing for your pelvic floor is sitting in a way where your low back is kind of curved and rounded. That's a, a shortening for your pelvic floor. Okay. And sitting up like this seems like a fix, but that doesn't really change what's happening in your pelvis. And it does change what's happening in your rib cage to kind of push everything forward. So this is one of those issues in the upper body that can affect your pelvic floor because now you're pushing pressure forward and down. So now you're getting a pressure. So instead of doing that, which hyperextends your low back typically. What you want to do is sit on your sit bones and kind of tilt your pelvis forward. So because I'm on the floor, I need a roller to get into that. So when I sit on the floor, I always use something to sit on so I can be in this nice neutral pelvis. On a chair, you should sit on the edge of a flat chair, maybe with something under your, your um, sit bones like this, and have that nice neutral pelvis, so not curled back, not super tipped forward. And that's kind of your optimal neutral position for long-term sitting. Okay, great. Is that so, yeah, um, and if you don't have, like, one of those half foam rollers, could you roll up a towel and sort of sit on the edge of the chair yeah. with that? Yeah, okay, that would work. I'm going to try that. perfect. Okay, perfect. Do it. Thank you, thank you. That's a great takeaway because that's definitely something I'm guilty of is, you know, when I'm doing all my research and writing and, yeah, of not sitting the right way. So that's going to help me a lot. Thank you. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and in terms of for the guys too, I mean, this is something that's important, you know, desk jobs. And, and do you also recommend getting up and taking breaks and just changing your position a lot as well throughout the day? 
Yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, there's no question in my mind that we need to do that. Um, yeah. Apparently, so Daniel Lieberman says that you start building up inflammation in your muscles after about 15 minutes of stationary positioning. Uh -huh. well, so <laughs> it's crazy, right? Yeah. Crazy. Insane. So like, yeah. So, you know, getting some movement often is really important. And there's been some really interesting research done recently saying that, you know, even if you just get up every half hour for a two to five minute walk, that that's mm -hmm. going to make a huge difference in your metabolic health, I think is what they were focusing on. I'll get you the yeah. link for that because it's really yeah. interesting. So I've yes, heard, movement yeah. breaks for sure. And I've they're heard. saying more often, they're saying like every half hour, every hour. So yeah. not as often as Lieberman's saying, but I try to take as many as possible, but also just changing positions when you sit. So that's why I'm on the floor right now. You know, that's yeah. why I have a standing desk that does a lot of that for you. Perfect. Yeah, we actually, I don't have one of the standing desks, but we have a number of standing desks in our office here for some of our, our staff. So that's uh, that's important. We're at least maybe a little bit ahead of the curve for a lot of people. It's, it's important, right, to, to change your position. Um, okay, another big topic, squatting. Tell us about squatting. So I know in yoga, for people that have practiced yoga before, squatting is usually, you know, a part of the practice and and um, I would say most people can in the classes that I go to anyways just from my own experience when I go to yoga class I mean these are yogis they've been doing yoga for a period of time they can squat easily not everybody can do it though and especially as we age I think that loss of mobility so please tell us what what if somebody can't do you know a full squat maybe you can show us a full squat as well um, what does that mean and how did they get there and how could they start to improve <laughs> this situation? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, you know, in a broad framework of, you know, what should humans be able to do? We obviously evolve squatting. That's how we would bathroom. It's how many cultures in the world still take rest. So, you know, if you were a hunter gatherer, you'd squat around your campfire or you just hang out with your friends and chat in a squat. So it's a pattern with full, let me just get into one. So you've got full hip flexion here, which is a, a pattern our hips need. You've got full knee flexion and people lose knee flexion too. You've got deep dorsiflexion of the ankle. So those flex positions are a movement nutrient, a micronutrient for your body that you need to have regularly. And then of course getting up and getting down is a body weight workout in and of itself that people are missing if they're missing the squats. So if you're just going into a chair, all of your ranges of motion are going to be smaller all of the time. And that's really what happened to our squat. So you almost 100% yeah. guaranteed were a champion squatter when you were two years old. Yeah. And then you stopped squatting because you're, you're modern and they stuck you in a chair. And so you lost your squat. Modern and Western, because, you know, I was just spending two years in Asia and there's lots of people who squat up until the age of whatever, 95 there, wow. because they never stop. They didn't stop. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Like our bodies just, they do what you ask them to do. But if you don't ask them for something for a while, then you've got to have yeah. a conversation about that. Yeah. So the conversation is about coaxing it back in. So what you're most likely to be missing, so what I see the problems are people will pop up on their heels to get a squat if they can't get into that deep flexion. So that's a lot about the hips, mm. more so than the ankles and heels for many people. So the, the ankles are part of it, but yeah. I would say the hips are the biggest thing. So hip flexion mobility, some okay. upper back mobility actually is also important. But what's nice about it is that, you know, the key to coaxing your body into a new shape is to make the shape easier. So you've probably seen people at the gym put wedges underneath their heels yes. when they do a weighted squat. Yes, this yes. addresses some of the hip flexion ankle stuff okay. and lets you get into a better kind of overall position. So this is your kind of interim baby steps so you can spend some time in a squat not feel like you're falling backwards not feel like there's tons of pressure in your in your mm. front of your leg so it's about kind of breaking it down now there's lots of other exercises to improve the hip mobility to improve the knee mobility to improve the up and down strength so i've actually got a, uh, a free giveaway on squatting because I, I created that last year and it's really cool actually because it's it's only one exercise that you do uh once a week or sorry uh -huh a week on each exercise four exercises a week for each exercise but people have made amazing changes and it's just really? about coaxing yeah. back that strength it's so cool yeah it, it's awesome it's beautiful so you've got a great yeah. squat because you go to yoga so that looks awesome wow. how does that feel okay. for you no it feels it feels good I find sometimes if I'm not limbered up is that um like I kind of have to shimmy to one side first and then and then get into it on on my left side so I go right first then left I don't know if that's normal or what's happening with that but uh for whatever reason but today I seem pretty good like I was able to get down pretty evenly and yeah yeah and then the, that's the get up right 
just getting up. Yeah, it's super, you know, there's no, yeah. there's no magic to squatting. What you might yeah. want to try doing is rolling up your yoga mat and using it behind your heels and just seeing if that feels any different for okay, you. Okay, yeah, I will do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's perfect. And you're just going to sink oh, yeah. down. There you yeah, go. that's good. That's good. Yeah, because what happens at a certain point is that, you know, you're, you're changing from having your spine being neutral, which it is right now to start. And as you go backwards, if you go down really slowly for me, right around there, you're starting to tuck and curl your pelvis under. So if you go deeper than that, you're really tucking your pelvis. Can you, can you feel how that changes? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's usually hard to feel. Um, it's not a problem, but what yeah. you might want to do, you know, if you want to kind of really be picky about your squat is really work on kind of keeping a little bit less, um, less hip curling under, going longer down in a neutral pelvis, which might mean keeping your knees a little bit higher. So see if you can kind of keep your shins a little more vertical. That's really good. There you go. And just oh, going to give yeah. you a little bit more access into your hips by not yeah. going right into your spine. Yeah. Okay. And that's why even for someone like you who has a squat, you can get a little bit more hips out of it just by bolstering up your heels yeah. um, rather than, you know, because otherwise your spine's going to tend to come. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's there better. you go. Keep your knees okay. actually higher rather than forward. So keep them less. Yeah, there you go. That'll like help this you get way towards me, like higher. Oh, that's right. Okay. Got you. All right. Thank you. So coming back to the squatting, um, how important is it that you can actually stand up from the squat? I mean, that's that's a marker of what strength from. Is it the quads? Is it your abs? Is it what are we what are we asking our body to do? And what does it mean if we can't get out of the squat? Well, it just means you're not strong enough to get out of a full squat. Like yeah, that's not yeah. you know, <laughs> there, yeah. there's no like giant meaning about it. But I do yeah. think that it's appropriate for a human to be able to lift their own body weight up and down. Yeah, um, that's a, a good marker of mobility and strength. Um, so it's a good goal to reach for. Okay, it's a full body movement, and depending on how you do your squat, it might be more quads, it might be more hamstrings, it might be more glutes. There's a lot of different stuff that can get involved based on your technique. So you know. Um, I think the value of doing it is, you know, that up and down is it's pumping through your whole system, literally, you know, you're using mm -hmm. your deep calf muscles, the soleus, which are super important for your metabolism. You're right. using your joints in a full range of motion and joints love and need to be used in the full range of motion. You're getting some help pelvic floor opening. You're getting some core. There's nothing that you don't use in a squat, basically. So it's mm -hmm. a great pattern to work on. And what's nice is you don't need to have that full squat to get the benefits. You need to do the work towards the full squat to get the right. benefits, if that makes sense. And, and can you cheat your way down? Like, can you hold on to something like the back of a chair or a pole or something? Is that something that you work with with your clients? Yeah, I think it's an awesome thing to do. So I, I really think the best way to work on your movement patterns is to find what you can do and work from there. Okay. So it's not even cheating. It's giving yourself a little bit of support so you can achieve something more with more integrity, if you will. So yes. I think the kitchen sink is a great spot to work oh. on your squat because okay. – Right? You're yeah. there anyway. Every time yeah. you go to the kitchen sink, you can do a little squatting practice. Yeah. And then you can get down. You can practice being in your hips, but you're not taking your full body weight. So it's an awesome, awesome place to practice. But a doorway works really great also. Chairs, as long as it's a really solid chair. Yeah, yeah. It's a sturdy one. Yeah. I thought it's not going to topple Don't all over die. you when you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. That's awesome. So, yeah, working on that squatting, that's going to be important. Um, another question about being able to get, and I've seen, uh, you've probably seen them as well, you probably have posted about this, I haven't seen your version of this perhaps, but the, the whole longevity test about being able to get up off of the ground without having to use your hands and with not too much effort, especially as we're aging. And this is one of, um, as you know, uh, in the aging population, uh, you know, risk factors for hospitalizations and, and for fractures uh, from falling. And number one, not being able to brace yourself because your musculature has, has diminished with the aging process and you haven't been on top of that, but also for the fact that you can't save yourself potentially out of a situation when you've actually fallen. So how important is this that then are there some things that we can do to help to strengthen ourselves um, to get it up off when if we have fallen and without the use of our yeah. hands? Yeah. 
without the hands. Okay, so I'm gonna say if you fall and need to get up, then use your hands. Like there's no there's no yeah. rule about the hands if you if if it's safety first, right? Of course. Yeah. Uh, so I, the study you're thinking of was a study in Brazil where they sort of matched people's capacity to get up off the ground no handed using a cross legged get up, and uh, they correlated life expectancy to the people's capacity to do this get up. So. I do not think that being really good at a cross-legged get-up is the thing that's going to help you live forever. But no. it is a good marker of your mobility and body weight strength. Um, so as a goal, I, th I think it's useful to work on. And it does mean that should you fall, like it's a real thing to not be able to get up off the, off the ground again. And, you know, it's even things like putting your shoes on and doing a yoga class because you're going to have to get down to the ground. Like you want to be able to get down to the ground. So number one is you just need to be able to get up and down from the ground. So that's strength and mobility. And number two is then maybe challenge yourself to doing it in a fancy way without your hands. So just like squatting, you can break that down in all kinds of ways. Um, my favorite way to break anything down is to make it higher. So um, I don't think I have a very good, um, well, a very high thing here, but this is even higher. So, you know, you could, you could do your cross like a get up from a block like that. And uh -huh. because the ground is higher, that's immediately easier than if you're trying to do it from the ground completely. So wow. that's yep. one way to kind of make it accessible. I actually have a whole YouTube on the cross-legged get up and, and ways to kind of prep your body for it. So I do okay, think perfect. it's good to work on. Yeah, we'll put the yeah. links in this video. So yeah, everybody check the links below so that you can see um, and work on that for yourselves. That's great, thank you. Awesome. Okay, good. Um, now, I know that I've seen some of your posts about tips on how to build our muscle mass, just like I was saying, you know, as, as we're aging, we know that we're losing a certain percentage of uh, our muscle mass. And if you're not actively, you know, staying on top of it and staying active with movement and of course, protein intake and everything else that we talk about here at, um, you know, on my channels. But yeah, do you have some, some tips to help us with our muscle mass with, with our aging? <laughs> Yeah, for sure. So I do think that some of the research is saying that, you know, you really do need to be lifting heavy. And I don't want to suggest that this is going to take the place of that. Um, I think that's a really good idea. But I do think the piece that's missing from the conversation is all your long day, because most of us are maybe going to go to the gym two or three times a week. And that's amazing. But there's so much you can do all day long to use your body more. So we're already talking a ton about it. You know, if you're squatting, if you're sitting on the floor, so I sit on the floor as opposed to a chair whenever I possibly can. That's muscle mass. Like I'm holding myself up with my core now, not the back of my chair. So it's good for your pelvic floor as long as you're not hunching over, but it's also good for your core strength and your hip strength. So all those things. Yeah. But then it even goes beyond that. So like, how can you move all day long in ways that are increasing your muscle mass? What can you lift? What can you carry? When you go for a walk, can you make it harder? Now I know that's not what most people like to do. They'd rather make it easier, but like if you can, yeah simply be making your life a little bit harder. Are you a gardener? Gardening is amazing for your body because you're constantly oh, yeah. moving and lifting. So, you know, there's there's this big picture that's part of the conversation that I think people tend to miss because we're so focused on only what you do at the gym and that's not the whole story. Right, yeah. So does that mean like, I don't know, putting on a weighted vest would be th something, um, carrying your own groceries and not having the, the little boy in the grocery store bring your groceries out. Like what types of practical things can we, can we actually do to make things a little bit yeah, harder? So yeah. Practically for sure. Carrying your groceries as much as you can. That's an awesome thing to do. Um, I, I don't have a weighted vest. I would be super pro weighted vest or rucking. So instead of walking, like actually specifically carrying weight, that's a really nice way to give yourself a, a heavy movement input. Obviously not everyone needs to make it heavy, but it's a great option when you're going for a walk anyway. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I often do is at my mother's house, I don't have any weights, but she's got big bags of, of water softener salt. So we'll leave one by the door. And then every time we go to the garage, I carry it out to the garage and then oh, I carry yeah. it back. Yeah. Uh, Cause like, why not? Right. Yeah, yeah. And she's got, we've got a hanging bar here as well. I know we're going to talk about hanging. So, you know, getting a bit of hanging every day, there's all muscle stuff. So just <gasps> yeah. figuring out ways that you can kind of carry more things in your day is really important or helpful anyway, I guess. Okay. Amazing. And not to be scared of it because I think, um, I'll speak for people that I see around me. There's, there's this fear factor with, and, um, 
in terms of, oh no, don't carry that, you know, you shouldn't do that. It's, it's too heavy for you. It's too heavy for you. <laughs> right. And it's like, no, I, I'm good. I'm strong. I can, I can do it. I can carry it because if I stop carrying it and if I stop carrying things, then this is when you lose that strength and the ability. And I think a lot of our strength comes from our mindset too. I, I'm sure you believe uh, the same principles, right? If, I mean, uh, given and putting aside the fact that maybe you've had an injury or something that you shouldn't be carrying something in your mind is like telling you, yo, you could do it. No, you shouldn't be. But um, yeah. I think our mindset has a lot to do with our strength, right? Sure. As soon as you decide you can't do something, you're definitely not going to be able to do it. And I hear that right. a lot where people are like, oh, I couldn't possibly do that. And it's like, well, what if you could? What if you could take a step yeah. towards it, you know? So yeah. for sure, like lifting something super crazy heavy when you've never lifted anything heavy, that might not be a really good idea. But starting to lift little things, you can 100% do. Like one thing I was doing in Indonesia was just grabbing a couple of rocks and taking them on my walk. And that's really good for your grip strength, too, which is another of those kind of yeah. longevity indicators. I think it's more a reflection of your overall strength, not your hands exactly, but it's yeah. still a correlation. So, you know, why not add a couple rocks to your rocket? And you can do that for sure. And you put them down if you're tired, like it's super easy. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's amazing. Amazing. Uh, okay. So let's get into the feet because I know this is the foundation. I know you, I believe you start a lot of your work probably with the people that you work with, um, in terms of mobility in the feet, uh, being barefoot, the barefoot shoes as well. Please enlighten us why we have to take care of our feet. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I think feet, um, feet are an easy win. I'm a super big believer in doing the stuff that's easy. And because, because our feet are really important, they connect us to our ground, which to the ground, which means that how they work has an impact all the way up to your head. So if your feet aren't working well, it's going to show up somewhere on your body, usually including your feet, but also your pelvic floor or your knees or your low back or wherever. And then also um, they're super weak because we've all been wearing shoes our whole lives, conventional footwear. So mm -hmm. working a little bit on your feet can give you way more impact than working a, a lot on, say, your quads, which you've worked on your whole life. So right. they're an easy win, and I love easy wins. Um, we don't really, I think, fully understand the implication of modern footwear for our feet. So we've kind mm -hmm. of all grown up in an environment where our shoes are focused on fashion and comfort mm -hmm. rather than function. And our feet are incredibly mobile, incredibly strong, incredibly adaptable parts of our body, uh, but our shoes limit that. And I don't think most of us realize that because it's so normal for us to wear conventional footwear. So I am a big advocate of uh, what's called minimal shoes, which just to be clear for people, that means a shoe that has a wide toe box that lets your, your toes splay out. Mm -hmm. It means it has a flexible and thinner sole so that your feet can move through their in, so intrinsic ranges of motion. Yeah. And it means not having a raised heel. So most shoes, even the ones that you don't think have raised heels, like your Vans, actually yeah. have some amount of heel rise. And that throws your whole body alignment out of whack instantly so you need the zero drop what most of us have experienced is growing up in these sort of conventional shoes so our feet are now limited pinched in weaker than they should be stiffer than they should be so i recommend moving to a more minimal shoe but one that respects your feet the way they are right now so if you have a lot of foot pain i wouldn't yeah. say go to the most minimal barefoot shoe i'd say go right. to a cushioned barefoot shoe if that I makes see. sense and then yeah. do exercises yeah. to go with it because the shoe itself will be helpful but you can get so much more out of it if you do some foot exercises to restore your feet if that makes yeah. sense yeah, I made, most recently, um, made the switch over. Um, my husband and I like to walk, and especially now in the summertime when it's nice, and we go for nice long walks, and I made the switch over to barefoot shoes. And I'm telling you, that first, the first couple of times I wore them to the gym and stuff, I didn't really notice anything because I wasn't doing a prolonged walk. But that first walk that I took, so a longer walk um, with the barefoot shoes, I like I couldn't make it through our entire walk because I, now I was using the musculature in a different way. I'm like, hon, I gotta stop. I can't, I can't go any further. These shoes, I'm like, my legs, like I could really feel it. And it only took that, like it was just that one walk, and then whatever you know, whatever I was able to strengthen 
strengthen. I think my body and my muscles are fairly adaptable and they, they strengthen very quickly. So then after that initial tough one that I couldn't get through, then I was okay. And I was like, wow, wow. Like I really feel, was feeling the effects and the difference of these shoes. I am I'm such a proponent. I tell everybody now that I see who's exercising, doing like, you've got to change your shoes because uh, it's scary. It's actually scary to me because people have the low back pain. They have the neck pain. They have the shoulder pain. I'm like, it's probably your feet. You know, it all starts down there. So that's why I love this topic. And can you show us some exercises? Like, what can we do to help, you know, if we're, you know, ground zero, have not worked on our feet at all? Uh, we will talk about bunions in just a second, but how can we get some strength back into the actual musculature of our lower limbs and our feet, ankles? Yeah, well, I mean, the good news is there's tons and tons and tons that you can do. Um, usually it's nice to start with some mobility, actually. So I think my, my favorite starter mobility exercise is super simple, and you can probably do it uh, right now okay, <laughs> if good, you're good, watching. Good. So it's just where you cross one leg over the other leg, and you take – so I've got my left foot over and my right hand – I'm going to take my right hand, I'm going to wiggle it in between my toes a little bit. Okay. So you're just gently trying to spread your toes by putting your fingers in between your toes. So that can be actually stiffer than you think. So go yeah. gently. Yeah. And you're just working in there until you kind of get to a place that feels right for you today. And then you give yourself a little bit of a foot movement session. So you can kind of uh, twist your toes back and forth a little bit. Uh -huh. You could pull your toes back towards the top of your foot, down towards the sole of your foot. And you can use your other hand to help too, so you get this massager. Now, you mentioned bunions. I don't want to jump the gun, but yeah. getting a little massage in between the big toe and the second toe here is really nice for folks with bunions because those muscles can get really tight. So that's a good um, – this is, this is always where I start people because it's such a great exercise and feels really good for most people. And what's cool about it is uh, you can, if you want, um, pause on that foot and then just compare how the foot you just worked on looks and feels compared to the foot you didn't do. And uh, I should have warned you to take your socks off first. Yeah, no, it's okay, it's okay. Um, you'll often notice quite a difference right away. Yeah. So yeah, there's like a spreading, right? And there's, yeah, there's a different kind of feel. I can, yeah, the stiffness in my left foot that I didn't sort of start to work a little bit compared to, it's incredible, within, like, what was that, like, not even 30 seconds of just starting it's ridiculous, to work it right? out. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay, that's amazing. Your feet are just, they're such cool, they're just such cool parts of our body because they've got so, here, let's do the other side because otherwise you're going to be one side yeah, and you'll be sad. So <laughs> let's take the, the right foot, cross it over, left hand, wiggle your fingers in between your toes really gently here. Uh, if this is really hard for someone, it can mm -hmm. be nice to have a foot soak first and even to use massage oil. So that's all, you know, it's all allowed. And there's no rules here, but twisting is really nice. That other hand massaging and then that kind of toes uh, back and up and down is really all good options, are all good options. Sorry, wow. I'm losing my English. <laughs> so it's just, it's a really nice, I do this in car rides all the time when I'm not driving. Oh, yeah. Driving. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. Amazing. So, yeah, and there's so much you can do. You know, the thing that you really, most people really need to do is to restore something called pronation and supination. And what that really means is that, you know, when we walk, our feet should pronate to absorb shock. So flatten and squish down to absorb shock. I don't know if you can see that, but it's this kind of squishing movement. And they should also be able to supinate, which is kind of sucking up, almost like pulling a Kleenex out of a box. You know, it's like that kind of up, that mm. supination pronation to stop shock absorption. You need a mobile foot to be able to get through that range of motion. Mm -hmm. And that mobility needs to travel up through your knees and to your hips. And so that's a foot pelvic floor connection because if you don't have that somewhere, your pelvic floor is already not getting the right loads. So you need to work on the midfoot mobility and the strength comes with the mobility, if that makes sense. I see, I see. Okay, so bunions, please. Um, I know I've seen one of your little exercises with the little ball and the, and the elastic for the bunions, that, yeah. which is yeah. amazing. Do you have any others or do you want to show us that one? What can we do for bunions? Because it is a, such a common problem for both men and women, and we always blame the high heel shoes, but it's really, you know, any modern footwear that is turning the toe uh, towards the other toes, it's, it's problematic. 
Yeah, yeah. And there's a fair bit that goes into bunions because those leg rotations also play into it. And, you know, they're, they're, it's not just about, you know, the narrow footwear or the heel, although those are a big deal. I'm going to do something a little different for bunions today because I want to actually talk about rotation in the hips. And most of us have sticky hips too. So let's work on bunions and hips at the same time. So we really want to have some good hip mobility because... Let's see, I'm gonna stand up. You won't see my face, but I'll kind of show okay. you for a second. And yeah. you can try this too. This is a good one to try. If okay. you turn your feet out to the side, and a lot of people walk with this kind of turn out to the side like that. Mm -hmm. If you now walk straight forward and just notice what part of your foot is pushing off the ground to move you forward. Yep. So can you feel how as your, as your feet turn out, there's more push coming from that big toe joint kind of on yeah. the inner side of the foot? Yeah. Oh, there you are. And then try putting your, your feet straight forward and see how you're going to be more likely to roll oh. straight over your toe. Can you feel yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. So that foot turnout, we do that a lot when we're stiff through that midfoot because that gives us a sort of a fake pronation. It gives us contact with the ground, but that's a yeah. huge bunion creator, flat foot creator, plantar fasciitis creator. And it yeah. travels all the way up to the hips because we don't have great hip mobility, hip rotation mobility with that one. So the exercise I'd love to do for that one is a little bit of hip rotation. So I'm going to get down on the ground with my yoga block and just give that, give that, um, give that a go. So, okay. So roll up your mat so that we'll do it a little bit differently. Roll up your mat so that your, um, your sacrum, the base of your spine is supported yep. on something. So I'm going to use my half roller and I'm just going to stick my legs in the air like that. And so you can roll up your yoga mat and just have that under your pelvis. So you've got support. Yep. So just half rolled and you can still have your head on the mat. So turn around so that your butt is on the rolled up part of the mat. Yeah, there you go. Okay, perfect. So you're just going to support yourself. That's just going to make it easier for you to get your legs in the air. And you're just going to stick your legs straight up in the air. You should be pretty relaxed. You shouldn't have to work too hard for that. Feet should be hip width apart, so there's a little bit of a gap between your legs. Okay. And what you're going to do is you're going to take your kneecaps, you're going to turn them so they face out to the outside edges of your yoga mat. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to turn them in so they face each other. And you're just going to keep kind of rotating your legs like that, in and out, mm -hmm. knees all the way in, knees all the way out. How does that feel for you? Oh, that feels good. Amazing. So we're doing a really pure hip rotation here. So you're really trying to kind of get as much range of motion out of your hips as you can. So really pull your knees in towards each other as you go in, really pull them out as they go out. You can almost make this a little bit um, harder by thinking about moving your legs as though they're heavy, stiff, concrete things. You kind of use some effort as you move. So you're not just, um, you know, Loosey goosey here. You're actually kind of screwing your legs in and out here, getting a little bit more hip rotation work, and you're creating that work by imagining your legs as very heavy, moving through maple syrup type of legs. Wow. There. And then you can bring your feet down and we'll come back up. But that's just a little hip rotation mobility um, drill that can help you kind of get more of that straightforward. Mm angle in your walking and help your hips move through their kind of correct rotational pathway more easily and more naturally than um than if they're not warmed up with that does that make sense yeah no that's cool and it's 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 so timely my daughter yesterday when we went to the gym she was uh asking me well what about the hips what about the hips i didn't know what to tell her <laughs> now i'm going to show her <laughs> exactly what to Amazing. do yeah for for the hips because she's she's big on working out and she lifts heavy weights and she does all this crazy stuff at the gym but she's feeling it in her hips and i'm like mm, yeah it's got to be coming back and she actually a lot of times does work out and train um barefoot which i'm i'm happy mm -hmm. about because she's already you know she's made that connection for herself but yeah this is this is important i'll be able to to show her that so that yeah it's helpful for bunions you never would have thought right that that connection there with the hips yeah love that love that um now i know another component of what you do i've seen seen some of your great videos where you hop up on a on a pole and you start walking and balancing Balancing. So tell us how important it is to still, even as, you know, as we're, now we're not kids anymore, that we still do the stuff that we did when we were kids, you know, in terms of 
you know, balance work and, and walking on logs and poles and all these things. And we didn't even think about it as kids, hopping up there and, and doing that. But why is that so important? Why should we continue to do that? I think you already touched on it earlier, you know, balance, especially as we age, is hugely important because the risk of falls is a really real risk. And it's not just, you know, not be able to get up. It's once you break something like a hip, you are facing potentially weeks of recovery, months of recovery, and you often lose muscle mass in that period. And muscle mass is what we need the most as we get older. So you really don't want to be in a position where you can't be mobile for several months because right. you're going to have an implication that's even bigger than that hip. So balancing on a rail isn't necessarily the best or the only way to balance, but it's a great option and it's super fun. So I think it's important yeah. that movement should be fun too. And so that's one that I like to do. But yeah. you know, you can balance, you can practice the same thing on a piece of tape on the ground and work yes. on kind of your, your dynamic balance. There's all kinds of ways to work on that. Yeah, that's great. I've done it like, um, like just on, you know, the hardware in our, in our bedroom. I've just like pretended that was my plank and, and it's amazing because your mind will, We'll see that plank and, and trying to keep your balance, it's a lot more difficult than what you would imagine, right? Um, I know that you can also get like a two by four, right? And just put that down on the ground. You're not too far up. It's not too daunting to do it that way. And that, that would be a great thing as well um, yeah. to practice on. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and hanging. So please tell us about the hanging. I haven't yet <laughs> endeavored to do much oh, hanging. I need to get going with this. You'll love I, it. They're, They're going to yeah, love it. Really? So nice. I have, Honestly, I have, it's the really? most fun. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so tell us. It's tell so good. Us. Okay. Okay, so... It's kind of the same thing as walking and squatting. Those are whole body natural movements that most of us are missing out on. And the thing about walking and squatting is that we actually get more of it than we do of hanging because when was the last time you were on the monkey bars? Right. But yeah. as a hunter-gatherer, you would have been climbing trees and pulling on things. Those are the same kind of movements for your body, that climbing. So hanging is a broad term to describe, you know, having your hands on a bar and holding your weight on that bar, which could mean just staying still. It could be staying still with your feet on the ground. It could be swinging and it could be crossing the monkey bars or anything in between. Like there's a big category of movement. So the nice thing is that that means that even when you're first starting, you can make it really accessible because you don't need to be, you know, doing pull-ups. You're just right. having your feet on the ground, getting a load into your shoulders. So this is so good because what you're doing is you're getting shoulder mobility, you're getting upper body strength. You're, we're back at muscle mass right again, right? That grip strength. But you're also working on rib cage mobility and breathing capacity. And then that turns into your core strength and your pelvic floor again. So, ah. you know, there's such a good... You know, I, I, you know, if you're thinking about movement nutrition, this is your ma a macronutrient category is that hanging, climbing, arms above your head, paddling, swimming and surfing. All of that is pulling upper body big movement. Yeah. But hanging is definitely one that I absolutely love. So I'm actually, um, my membership program opens every October and I always do a free workshop. So this year's free workshop is called Everybody Can Hang. <gasps> and uh, it's. Literally! <laughs> I'm so excited. It's okay, awesome. I'm there. I'm there. Yeah. Yeah. It's free and it's going to be so it's, it's awesome because we're going to do all the prep exercises to help you get the most out of hanging, which also, by the way, that's your chest tissue, right? That's the yes. pectoralis, which underlies your breast tissue. So, you know, there's no clear research that says, yes, you should have strong pecs because that'll be better for your breast health. Yeah. But, like, that's fluid, that's lymph flow, that's strength. Mm -hmm. So, like, I want to have strong pecs personally just for that long term yeah. breast health. Yeah. Um, implication. Rounded shoulders, upper body posture, hanging will help with all of that. So we've got this free class that will help you get the prep stuff. And I'm going to give you a keep forever video on how to go to the monkey bars and, and build up your monkey bars. So uh, it's <gasps> an awesome start hanging package. So I'm yeah. so excited Maybe. about that. That's awesome. Because that's Maybe. like one of the areas that I don't know, I have a fear factor. I, I don't love heights and stuff. Not that I have to hang from like a 100 foot tree or whatever. But it's like, yeah. So that's good, but building that strength. I am a swimmer, so I, I, I might have a little bit of shoulder strength, but I know that there's so much more in grip strength too that I find um, as I'm aging, like I, I didn't have to think about it before, but now I actually am, am conscious of the fact that oh, I've got to keep this strong, right? Because that's, that's yeah. a big thing. Um, and yeah, okay, so that, that is good. And when, I know you're going to teach it in the course, but can you give us a little preview? Like when you are hanging, like what, where, how how do you work up to the fact that you have to build the strength so that you don't injure your shoulder area and yeah. the smaller yeah. muscles? 
Is there like baby you know steps it's to not get there? Like a yeah. giant secret. <laughs> like all yeah. it is is you keep your feet on the ground. You just keep your feet okay, on the ground yeah. and you moderate the amount of weight on your on your arm. Like it's I see, it's, yeah. it's yeah. very accessible that way. The way that I actually like to start people hanging is side hanging. Uh, oh, or, you know, even yeah. front hanging back to the kitchen sink, you can get a lot of hanging load without even being at a playground. So right, you can hold yeah. a doorway um, and you just don't take your full weight and you can start building up slowly there. So it's it's very easy to moderate, but it will get more fun once you get your feet off the ground and start yeah. swinging. So that's when you start feeling like a 12 year old. Um, yeah, yeah. But safety wise, you know, there is something to think about because especially when we first start, we like to kind of reach right up. Like, you see how as I reached, I lifted my, my whole rib cage there. Yeah. You try it, try like really reaching. You're gonna get, you know, there's like this 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 spine thing that happens too, right? Yeah, yeah. Feel that? So now see if you can kind of like let your ribs kind of come down, curl yourself into a little bit of a ball. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now keep your ball and now lift your arms up and don't lose your ball. Oh. Keep your ball. So Ooh. you're gonna get some core keeping your ball there, right? Yeah, yeah. And then that's about the limit of your shoulder. And if you keep going higher than that, it's gonna pull on your spine because you've only got this much shoulder for most right. of us. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we've we've lost a lot of shoulder mobility because we're so good at moving through our spines. Yeah. So when you start hanging, having your hands a bit in front of you is mm. going to help you keep the integrity of your core yeah. a little bit more than if you try kind of arms above your head. Okay. At least until you've worked on that shoulder mobility. So that's my safety tip. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can really feel it in my core already. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. So that's cool. great. So good. Um, and I know in terms of our rib mobility that is something that we often don't think about in terms of you know with breath work with stress relief um, i think the ribs with you know chronic back pain and loss of mobility in our spine as well is definitely related i know that you have a great tip using a pillow to help to sort of fold over. Can you show us this one? Because I think this is remarkable and it's something that's so easy that people could easily do even, you know, during the day, take a little break and, and do this technique to help to relieve, uh, you know, any tension and um, what's happening in our ribs. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, just by way of background, you know, I think that when we sort of really look into how we breathe, um, I'm just going to lose the sweatshirt so you can see me a little bit easily, more easily. When we breathe, our diaphragm actually goes from about the bottom of our ribcage to about our nipples. So that's where our diaphragm is moving and that's where our lungs are. So we have the ability to increase the room for the air that we bring into our lungs by moving our ribs. Mm. What you're alluding to is the fact that most of us have lost the ability to move our ribs or we can only move our ribs in one way. So we get right back into that kind of like lifting our arms overhead, hanging hyperextension thing. This is also a rib flow. This is my spine, but it's also my ribs kind of flaring out in front. We get yeah. really compressed in the back. So that's the technique that you're you're interested in. It's kind of called rock back breathing. You can do it in a chair. I'm going to do it kneeling just because that way you can see me. It's usually best to have like something under your low ribs that you can kind of drape over. And what this does is it helps you naturally stretch out and decompress this mid back area. So it's super simple. You're just going to hang out here and you're going to take gentle inhales into this kind of bra strap, low back, mid back area. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to take a nice, soft, non force exhale. You're making sure there's no tension going into your neck for this. And okay. you're just draping and breathing and it's great for your nervous system. You could definitely do a longer exhale and an inhale here, but the inhale is going to really stretch you and then the exhale is going to relax you so you just let that be a very natural exhale and five to ten breaths like that done regularly is going to open up a ton of tissue in your mid back area which will allow those ribs to be more mobile in an area where they're often compressed for many of us mm -hmm. so i'm just how does that my, feel am i letting my hands just letting my arms just totally be dead and, and so you can do a few things like if you were on a chair you might just like drape your arms and just find a comfortable place for them but since you're on the ground you could try with your forearms um you know resting on the ground just kind of pull your forearms towards each other and press into them slightly and widen your your shoulder blades as well and that'll give you a little bit more i guess a runway mm -hmm. room in your upper back so that's an option but it's not necessary you can kind of do what you like okay cool yeah, really, really looking to kind of feel that expansion. Yeah, really. Oh, there you are. 
Yeah, it really does open up the, yeah, the back, like it just expands, which is fantastic. Yeah. And how, how long would you stay That's in that position for? I mean, five to 10 breaths would be awesome. Uh, you could probably stay for two minutes if you wanted to. Uh, it's really, you know, as, as much time as you're comfortable there. And then doing it frequently because you want to give your body that kind of input to, to help. So, you know, it's partly about keeping your ribs down so that you're not constantly doing this, but then you, yeah. you kind of coax that extra mobility out of your mid back with that breathing as well. Okay. All right. Awesome. And now that I'm sitting down, I mean, what is your preferred sitting position? Like if you were to have a low desk, um, do you move around when you're sitting at your desk? Because I'm going to actually start doing this like very soon. So I, I want, I want to know because, I, well, it's funny, Petra, because I think about when I was a kid, I was always on the ground, like sitting on the ground. Yeah. Anything that I did, I was always on the ground. Like it was, and I look at my kids too, like my younger kids, the, I mean, the teenagers and the 20 somethings, they're, you know, they're always on a chair doing whatever, but my little guy, he's, he's always on the ground. Like it's so comfortable for him. And I'm like, yeah, where did we lose that? Like as adults, where, what happened? You went to school. You went to school. That was yeah, a little bit wrong. I guess. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> but, yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's such a great, you know, it's, it's your secret weapon because it takes no extra time. You could totally watch a movie sitting on the ground and yeah. you're getting so many benefits. But the best thing is there's no perfect position. So they just give you different things. So kneeling, you know, you're getting a foot stretch when you're kneeling and you're working on your quad length. So that's yeah. awesome. And if that's uncomfortable for somebody, they can just get a cushion or a yoga block and then raise their butt up a little bit. And so that's often a more uh, accessible option for people who find full kneeling is too challenging. That's a great way to yeah. do it as well. I yeah. love your creativity. It's awesome. <laughs> so that's really good. Um, cross-legged is great. And there's lots of variations of cross-legged. Okay. So go into any, and you can totally keep your yoga mat under your sit bones. That'll help yeah. you keep that pelvis untucked and neutral. Like we talked about right at the beginning. So you almost tip forward. Yeah, that looks beautiful. You're doing it perfectly. And then because you're a human, you cross your legs the way you always cross your legs. So now try crossing your legs the other direction. So other leg in front and see what that's like. Yeah, I have to think about that always. <laughs> Is it weird? <laughs> yeah, it feels so weird, yeah. But yeah. It's the same, yeah, so if yeah. it feels weird, you should do more yeah. of it because you don't do it ever. So that's that's different for your hips than the other type of sitting. Yeah, yeah. You know, V-sets are awesome. Pelvic floor stuff often comes from inner thigh tightness. And so yeah. a V-set is great. And you can kind of give yourself a massage because why not? Yeah. Um, one leg up, one leg down. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. Okay. You can and try I a supported imagine. squat. Like, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, these are all, I test these all the time every day. You? Yeah. you might need a little bit more under you for your squat. So, you know, you're, you've got to work yeah. with what you have, but for you, you'll be happier with about twice that much, I think. Yeah. So this is basically your squat if you don't have a full squat yet. Mm. And then all the kind of mermaid sit options. So oh. knees. Oh, yeah, this would be yeah. good. Beautiful. Yeah, this would be good, too. And then just changing it up, right? As you get tired of one position, you change to the whatever, whatever feels, and just... Keep working away. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It'll right? make you even, even more able to work all day long. Exactly. Those are all great, great options. Okay. Was there anything else that you wanted us to cover? And, and please let my followers know as well how they can reach you, where do they find you, and to sign up for your courses. Please let us know. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, I guess like the big takeaway for me or the big thing that I hope people can take away is that there's tons of ways to move in, in ways that you don't think that that, that exists right now, right? Like that our bodies need movement. Everything in our bodies is connected. You know, your knee problem could be because of your foot problem, like we were talking about. And so it's a huge world to explore that will give you so much value. So, you know, most of us know a fair bit about nutrition and make some choices in a, an informed way around nutrition, but knowing about movement is, is less widespread because most of us just have this kind of fitness focus. So I always think that starting with feet is a good idea, but understanding that it's all connected is really huge. And um, yeah, we've got, well, we've got the shoulder workshop coming up. That's actually a launch for my Take 10 coaching program, which I really recommend only for people who want to do a deep dive. So it's great, but it's not for everybody. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I've got lots of things that aren't as deep dive as well. So uh, lots of free stuff to share that will definitely help your journey. And I love it. I love encouraging people to move. So I hope you decide to, to get, or that your, your listeners can find some inspiration and ideas from this. 
Oh, I'm sure they definitely will. And it, it was so great speaking with you today, Petra. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And I look forward to, you know, trying all your techniques and, and signing up for the hanging one. That's going to be amazing so I can learn myself. And we'll do a follow-up and, and see how everybody's doing. Thank you so much for spending time with me Love today. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me, and I can't wait to hang with you. All right. Sounds good. <laughs>